recorded conversations, the podcast that's dedicated to compassionately considering all perspectives while engaging in authentic, connected dialogue. I'm Danielle Kingstrom. I want to take care of a little housekeeping before we plunge into the next discussion. And so Patreon followers, I know you're aware of what's going on, but my listeners may not be. And so I'm going to share this with you. I joined Tinder. Yes, I am married and I put myself on Tinder. And if you want to know why, if you want to follow along with the chronicles of my Tinder, what I'm learning, what I'm researching, what kind of observations I'm making, and what kind of erotic evolution I might be going through, I encourage you to find me on patreon.com slash Danielle Kingstrom. Each day, I update my journal entry for the Chronicles of Tinder, and I let you know what I'm learning. I let you know what I'm experiencing. I am I'm mesmerized, and I'm fascinated. I was no stranger to dating sites when I was single, And there is a part of my journey right now that has convicted me to, I don't know, break through some kind of exteriority and look beyond what I have in my immediate proximity. What that may bring, I don't know. I've had a lot of assumptions that people think I'm just trying to lock down a threesome, that I'm trying to just dance around with an open marriage and have a free-for-all flesh fest, but... That's not really what it's about. And if you know anything about me by now, I'm never that simple. I'm never that superficial. I don't do the easy things. And that would be too easy. My plan is to have my husband join us back on the show. And we will talk a little bit about this. We will also be doing some vlogs on the Patreon where we're sharing kind of what's going on. And there's some crazy stuff going on. I just want to say that. The other night, we made a discovery through Tinder, my husband and I, and he's on Tinder as well. Um, And yes, a lot of this is for research, but a lot of this is for evolution, erotic evolution. And um, just fascinating things, but surprising things, like what the fuck moments. So for as little as $2 a month, you can be a part of this. You can see what I'm going through in this journey. You can throw down your comments, your criticisms, your judgments even, and I will happily respond to them. So not only will that $2 that you contribute to my Patreon account every month grant you access to the Chronicles of Tinder, but it shows me that you support my work. It tells me that you like my podcast, that you want to continue hearing things. And it brings you into a little bit more of a personal side of me, Danielle, what goes on with the mindset of my madness. And I, I might be a little bit more revealing over there, too, to kind of piggyback off of Brene Brown's whole in the arena with me. And it's that whole idea that if you're not in here playing with me, if you're not in here supporting what I'm doing, if you're not in here doing the work like I'm doing, then who the hell are you to criticize me? This way, you've paid to criticize me. So... Let that be an invitation to you. Let that just be an invitation to get to know me on a more intimate level. Because while I share a lot about who I am and what I think and what I believe here on the podcast, as well as on my social media, on Patreon, I'm an open book, literally. So something for you to consider. Maybe you don't like to pay to listen. Maybe you don't like to pay for additional content. And I totally get that. But maybe you'll reconsider. I mean, Tinder. Uh, I also have a series coming up where I am interviewing Trump supporters, people that will publicly admit that they support Donald J. Trump, our 45th president of the United States of America. The series will be called The Compassionate Conservative. This is in some way to degrade or condescend conservatives. I myself once sat on the conservative side of the political spectrum. I was a registered Republican. I voted for George W. Bush, I voted for John McCain, and then I voted for Gary Johnson. So I myself did not vote for Donald Trump, but I am intrigued. I'm intrigued by the overall je ne sais quoi that has taken place over the last four years and the division and the the blatant hatred that people have developed. I know the, the right and the left have always been against one another, but this is kind of an unprecedented division of our country. Maybe it's not even. Maybe it's just that we are just so aware of it because it is literally streamed to us in our hands. But I didn't really like how easily people were willing to just categorize someone and throw them in a box and, oh, you voted for Trump, therefore this, 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 and this must be true about you. 
Interestingly enough, a couple of the people that I brought on the show to have a discussion with me are black men who voted for Donald Trump and who continue to support Donald Trump. So for me, what that did is that eroded that whole idea that if you are a Republican, you are a racist. More so than that, I asked the obvious questions. I asked the questions that the media has been trying to convince us is true about the Trump supporter. Do they hate women? You know, do they hate gays? Do they hate black people? Do they hate foreigners? Do they hate whatever? And, you know, the answers might surprise you. This really was a compassionate way to consider the other perspective. And I hope that I hope that you'll appreciate it. I hope that you'll learn something from it. I hope that the takeaway is that maybe you start to realize that it's too easy to throw somebody in a box and to label them and to reduce them to a bunch of assumptions from across the screen green or across the street or across the aisle. I think that if we get comfortable in thinking that it's okay to hate certain people or define certain people as evil, it's just going to continue to widen the gap. And right now we are in a time of where unity is crucial, where connectedness is crucial and at the same time lacking. And so the series is meant to just reveal to you a little bit, a little bit more about humanity that you might not know. Before we get started, I just want to I just want to say I know what we're going through right now is something we have never experienced before. We are filled with uncertainty, we're lonely, we're cooped up, we're isolated. We are surrounded by panic and fear and things are really get heavy from time to time. I know a lot of people are living by themselves. They're missing touch. They're missing physical proximity to other people. It looks and feels hopeless, but I don't believe it is. I think there is so much greatness that is going to follow from this time of suffering, this time of silence, this time of solitude. And I know it doesn't seem very encouraging, but I know we're going to get through this. We're all going to get through this. And as cliche as it sounds that we're all going to be okay, I really believe that. I really believe in the end we will all be well. But right now this is just a storm and we can't hurry a storm. The storm has to pass on its own. The only thing we can do is go through it. And if we go through it, we'll come out on the other side. The one thing that I know is that storms bring growth. We need storms. I am a farmer's wife. We are very dependent upon storms, and not that I like the destructive storms, but I know that the storms bring the rain, and the rain is what gives birth to life. It's what grows life. It's what we need for life to continue to blossom. My hope is that you'll try to remain as optimistic as I'm trying to be now. I suffered. I was apathetic. I was cynical. I was, I don't almost maybe depressed, and I am no stranger to depression, I suffered from it uh, when I was a single mom. I've suffered from it from time to time. I suffered from it when my husband was in Iraq. I suffered from it a few years ago. I suffer from it annually. It seems just about every harvest season I go through some kind of a autumn depression, seasonal depression. What I know about those depressions is I always come out of them and I look back and I see what hurt me and what made it difficult for me to pull myself out of that funk and... I I think in a way I teach myself how to better prepare for these dark times, for these times of seclusion, for these times to go inward. And I think if we are willing to apply a silver lining context to this, this is a great time for all of us in the season of rebirth to go inward and to sit with ourselves and to sit with our thoughts and to to work out things that maybe we have been putting off because we've been so busy. I know a lot of people don't like optimism when everything looks so gloomy and glib and uncertain, but I think that's what keeps us moving forward, right? That's what we got to just, just keep swimming, just keep swimming. I love Disney. I love the fact that they give me little mantras. Uh, Elsa, I am grateful for, for the let it go. And, you know, as silly as it may be, it's a creative little reminder for us to, you know, receive it all. Receive it all, hold it all in, sit with it, go inward, process it, analyze it. And in the end, when it's all said and done, hopefully sooner than later, we will come to understand what's really important. We will come to be more appreciative about 
our alone time, we will come to appreciate the connections that we have. We will come to appreciate the busyness instead of letting it overwhelm us. Maybe we'll come to understand that in order for us to have organization, we need a little bit of chaos. And I know thoughts and prayers mean nothing to a lot of people. And, you know, in some regard, I'm even cynical to the whole thoughts and prayers idea. But I think right now, thoughts and prayers are kind of what are going to get us by. And it doesn't have to be for other people. Pray for yourself. Think about yourself. Think about what you want for yourself. Pray for what kind of outcome you do want. What do you want to learn from this? What do you want this storm to bring you? What are you willing to see this storm as? A gift or an impediment to your journey? My next guest, Kyle Butler, shares his story about his journey and the obstacles that he's had to overcome. I have a few conversations once in a while where I can't help but see that they're timely meaning that we can pick up these conversations and plop them down in any instance or experience we might be collectively going through and see that this would be helpful and encouraging to a lot of people. And that's that's my hope, that you will hear this conversation between me and Kyle, and it will encourage you, and it will bring you a little bit of hope and optimism, and that it might help you see things better. It also might charge you a little bit. It might activate you a little bit. Kyle says some pretty controversial things regarding politics. He says some pretty controversial things regarding the Bible. He has a very open mind when it comes to understanding God's love. Kyle is no stranger to the church, however. He began ministering at the age of 13, and he became one of the main speakers for his youth services. He was ordained in ministry by the age of 21, and at the age of 26, he was installed as a pastor of the church that he grew up in. In 2008, he had an awakening and he embraced the revelation of grace and the revelation of God's unconditional love. This helped free him from the religious dogma that he grew up believing and preaching for many years. Kyle is no longer pastoring a physical congregation, but you can catch him co-hosting on Facebook Live on Mondays at 8 p.m. Eastern Time. You can find him co-hosting Graceline Tuesdays at 7 p.m. Eastern. You can find him co-hosting Thinking Into Greatness. He can also be seen on Thursdays at 7 p.m. Eastern on the Three Chord Strand Ministry page. Sunday mornings at 10 Eastern in the GOMA Network, which is also live on Facebook. To connect with Kyle, you can find him on Facebook, Twitter, and his YouTube channel, and by visiting his website, kylelbutler.com. Listeners, I ask you to compassionately consider the perspective of Kyle Butler. Enjoy the show. The only thing that was good was going to church. That was the only thing that God was okay with, and we were always in church. Um, I remember early on, though, because I was always very curious, and I always had a lot of questions, and I always, you know, where, where maybe my brothers and sisters and maybe some of the other kids in church were kind of more aloof about church. I, I was I was really kind of tuned in, so I was fascinated early on by some of the stories that I heard about God, you know, any, and especially anything that had to do with faith. I was, I was, I was so uh, inspired by stories of faith. You know, the, um, Daniel and Elias, then uh, uh, David and Goliath, Jesus walking the war, anything, anything that was like a supernatural event where, um, you know, faith was involved. And uh, I remember when I was a little boy, we, I was in a youth choir, this kid's choir, and the choir director, who was the pastor's wife at the time, came and said, Okay, I have a new song, and she sung the song to us, and it was faith, 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 just a little bit of faith. You don't need a whole lot. Just use the little that you've got. And I begged her. I begged her. I was maybe six or seven years old. I begged her to let me sing that song, to sing the lead in that song. I couldn't really sing, but my persuasion uh, carried over, and I won out, and she let me sing the song. But I was just so inspired by faith because it was a faith song. Well, fast forward now, 21 years old, 22 years old, I'm into ministry. I've grown up in this Pentecostal holiness environment where 
holiness was sought with everything we had. And, and um, you know, I just, I rolled up my sleeves and thought, this is what God wanted me to do. This is what God, this was God's calling on my life. I better get at it. Because I also was taught growing up in that holiness and Pentecostal holiness denomination that um, if you don't do what God wants you to do, he'll kind of force you to. And uh, you don't really want that. So it's best to submit yourself to God's will and his way because he'll, he'll kind of force you to do it. And, and that, that won't turn out good. And then you'll end up having to do it anyway. But it'll probably be with a lot of calamities or after a lot of calamities. So here I was, you know, I'd, I'd been programmed somewhat to believe that my life was directed towards ministry. This was God's call in my life. So at an early age, 21 years old, I said, okay, let me just dive in. In which I got engaged, I, I'm sorry, ordained, not engaged. <laughs> um, a few years after that, the pastor who I'd grown up with decided he was going to move to North Carolina, back to South Carolina, and he decided to, to install me as a pastor. Uh, at such know, looking, a young age, wow. Yeah, 26. And looking yeah. back on it, I remember when he, he called me on the Saturday, he called me the Saturday before and said, brother Kyle, uh, you know, it's time. We're going to go ahead and put you in as pastor. And, and you know, I, I, I'm okay. I mean, I, I didn't think I can say no. I didn't think I can say I'm not ready. You know, he was my mentor. He was my, my, my predecessor. So I, you know, I, I figured God had told him that it was my time and okay. I remember after the church service where he announces to the whole church that, I'm going to now be the pastor and to stand by this young man. And he has my approval. I thought, I thought after church, he pulled me aside and said, okay, young man, let's go to dinner. Let's go grab something to eat, something to eat. And I'm going to give you the pastoral handbook on how to do this thing. <laughs> well, he comes, you know, we get off of the stage where we, where we were and we walk out and we finally get a chance to engage one another. And all he does is he, he extends his hand and says, be encouraged. And that's it. <laughs> that was the whole thing. Oh, uh, so I went into this whole thing, really not knowing anything, not really engaged in it, not really uh, proud of it, not really inspired by it because a big part of it thought I was just doing whatever God wanted me to do. And I just needed to do it. And that went along for a good portion of time. I just really was going through the motions. Uh, and then that brought me to 2007 where this, I was in the mortgage industry as well. And the mortgage industry was starting to collapse around me. And, 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 and I looked down the road and saw this financial crisis coming my way. And out of great panic and fear, like I had done every other time before in my life, I, I looked up to heaven in panic and said, God, you got to do something. God, you can't let this happen to me again. God, I can't take another collapse. God, you know, I mean, I'm in great, great distress. And I hear something inside of me. And um, what I heard was, you have to find the right seed for the need. And, and, mm. and, and instinctively, I knew what this meant. And it was probably one of the very first times, you know, when I heard something, I knew what to do. And that's where it all started. That's where this whole metamorphosis started way back in 2007. Uh, it, it took me in a whole different direction. And, you know, by 2000 and maybe 14, uh, well, I was pretty far gone from everything I'd learned. <laughs> so you peeled everything back and started over and decided what you were going to, what you realized really was of the kingdom of God and really just seemed a little too messed up for you to continue accepting. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the, the very first thing that, that started to change was I heard, um, you don't trust my word. Now at the time I'm thinking, you know, the Bible, I'm thinking, well, you, you know, you're right. I don't really trust your word. I had no confidence in any parts of what the Bible really said, as, especially watching people like my mom and different people in my, in the generation before me, you know, pouring everything they had into this Bible and not really seeing it manifest much. 
So I didn't really have any confidence in, in that part of God's word, like God's word can make you and change you and do all these things for you. I never really had any confidence in that. So when I heard that, I thought, okay, I really got to start focusing on the Bible and getting God's word into my life and really paying attention to God's word and letting God's word uh, transform my life. And I went down that path. So that kind of led me to the word of faith for a little while. And uh, in 2008 and nine, I was trying to pour myself into that. And I kind of got a little discouraged along the way because still I, I, I wouldn't see anything happening. But then in 2009, I heard another one of these instinctive moments, which was, son, you have no idea how big my grace is. And that was mm. when everything really started to change, you know, because um, early on, I started to hear things from within that would totally violate everything I thought I knew and everything I thought I heard or had ever learned, you know, and, and I'd, I'd hear something fresh. I hear something that would lead me to more rest or lead me to more peace or tell me I wasn't condemned or tell me that I was loved or tell me that I, I didn't have to do all this stuff that I was doing. I would hear these things and it was in total contrast to everything I'd ever been taught because growing up in that Pentecostal holiness environment, your performance, your anointing, your your power, all that stuff was predicated upon how much you prayed, fasted, studied, went to church, worship, mm -hmm. danced around the building and all those things. And I grew up in that culture. I grew up trying to emulate those that were before me who I thought were powerful men and women of God. And I tried to do that whole thing and, and get it through my performance. And it just never worked for me. So I, I really was, you know, really despondent. So when I would hear these things from the inside, I remember one time hearing, son, you have, when are you going to trust what I've already placed inside of you? And I remember like, what? Like, I already have everything? That can't be. I haven't prayed enough in my lifetime yet to get it. You know, and I started going down this list of all the reasons why it wasn't possible. But when I heard that, oh my gosh, it, it brought me such peace. So it was, it was just things like that, just words that I would hear from within that would totally violate everything I had learned. And then I started realizing, okay, I got a choice to make. I can either hold on to this stuff that has been nothing but turmoil, nothing but headache in, this, in a large sense, or I can take this that I'm hearing that's bringing me instant peace. And so I started to just take whatever I was hearing and going with that. And it really started to open up the doorway to uh, kind of where I am now to really, you know, with a much better sense of father's love, a much better sense of father's um, bigness, if, if I can say it that way. And um, it, it, it's, it shattered most of my theology that I had and giving me something that I, I feel like really kind of fits God a lot better. <laughs> and you feel like you have to say it too, don't you? Like you can't not know this anymore and not tell other people. I feel like I had a, like a moment like that too. And it, I think for years I was always taught that that voice I was hearing in my head that told me weird things was not to be listened to. That's the devil yeah. or that's your <laughs> ego or no, that's yeah. not right. And yeah, it came to, I think I was coming off of like Ravi Zacharias and Tim Keller mm -hmm. and that kind of persuasion. And I thought, yeah. and it was right around the time my daughter was coming out, questioning her sexual identity and then coming to terms with I'm queer. And I was like, oh, are we going to fix this? And yeah. it was between my husband and just this inner like screaming that was telling me this isn't right to to have this view towards your own daughter. And it, I had to finally go, okay, so all that stuff I'd been hearing was right. And then you're in a position and we're all in this fruitful position right now with technology where it mm -hmm. almost feels like a betrayal to not let people know. <laughs> yes. And, yeah. and sometimes we have to let them know in the most blatant ways. And it's, yeah. it's a shock wave for a lot of people. And I noticed that about you on, especially like your Facebook feed and even in some of the podcasts I've heard you on and the videos you've done, you say it how it is. And it's hard for a lot of people because they've been yeah. trained and programmed just like you had the upbringing of such to 
-hmm. reject that inner knowing and reject that resonance that pings off of other people that you go, Oh, well, that sounds really good, but I've been told this and this and this. So recently you posted something that made me go, Hmm, I don't, I don't like that. And, (laughs) and I've been wrestling with it. And I actually talked to somebody, I think yesterday about it. And you, and I think I've probably said something like this to you threw this down and I just want you to pull it back. You don't have to like defend yourself, but you were like, I say what I say and I'm not going to argue with you. I am not going to debate with you. I, I am not here to convince you. And for a minute I was like, okay, boy needs to back up his beliefs though. Cause that's what I've always been taught. Like if you're going to say something, qualify it. And that's that argumentative desire I have too. But I'm just, so I'm coming to terms with kind of shifting a little bit and not being like, I don't like that, but I want you to pull that back. And I want you to help me understand why that is not only a bold thing to do, but a smart thing to do. Well, again, growing up in this Pentecostal holiness environment, I was taught and, and I, we live by this ideology that we were the only people that had it right. You know, we, we had, I mean, they, they, at one point, one of our locations, we probably had about six or seven churches within a half a mile radius. And, you know, we'd come out of church and look down the block and, you know, see other churches. And the comment always was, they don't, they don't have anything. Mm. God ain't there. They ain't got no Holy Ghost. I'd hear that a lot. People would come to visit our church and guest pastors would come and, and they would preach. The pastor would allow them to preach. He, he, of course, he invited them. He let them preach. And he called me or maybe some of the other ones, you know, by the time I got into ministry, he called me afterwards and, you know, talk about how terrible of a job he did. He didn't know anything. He wasn't mm-hmm. saved, you know. So we kind of grew up in this environment like we had it. You know, we had it. Our church had it. You know, we were the praisers. We were the anointed ones and things like that. And, you know, you, you, you pick up this, the, this egoic type mindset that you're the stuff and yeah. no one else knows anything like you know. And you, you carry that with you. You think you're it. You know, you, you pour yourself into the Bible. You, you, you read it as you understand it. And you, you memorize verses and you get your, your view of what you believe it says. And it can't possibly mean anything different. And then as a pastor, even though I'm not a controlling person, when I was pastoring, if someone would come and ask me a question, I would skillfully, not purposefully, but when I look back on it now, it was pretty skillfully. I would divert my answer around my interpretation of something, trying to steer them into my view of something, Mm. you know, and start off with that. But see, the Bible says, and let me tell you what that means, you know, and do all that. Well, when I started, you know, coming into the understanding God's grace and love better, and and so I'm posting these things now, and then they're contrary to what most people believe. Mm -hmm. What do you mean God loves everyone unconditionally? Prove it. Okay, well, here's the scripture says that this, yeah. and you know, well, no, it doesn't mean that. Oh, yes, it does. How can you not see it? Well, you know, mm. and so you, you know, you're doing that in the early stages of all this. Um, and then maybe about a year ago, I came to a place. I said, "This is a journey. We're all on a journey. Mm-hmm. This, this, every single person's on a journey. I need to respect your journey as much as I respect mine. I need to respect where you are." just as much as I respect where I am. And I, I started realizing that my interpretation, you and me, me and someone else, we can sit down and, and bring up a topic and I can find verses that support my view and you can find verses that support your view and neither is willing to back up off of their view because they have the Bible verses to support them. And I realized that's not gonna, that doesn't work for me anymore, mm. you know? And so over time, I, you know, I started appreciating the journey. I stopped calling myself a teacher, so to speak, because I really was proud to be a teacher. I didn't want to be a preacher. I wanted to, a pastor. I wanted to be a teacher. I wanted to teach the word. I wanted to break it down and connect the dots. And I started pulling back off of the teacher thing and said, I'm just presenting. I'm just mm-hmm. going to present some stuff out there. Give people something to think about. You know, like some of the posts that I had seen years 
leading up to now, I'd read something, think, hmm, that's interesting. Hmm. Never thought about that. And, you know, it played with me for a little bit on the inside. And sometimes I would come to see it that way as well. Sometimes I just would forget about it. Mm-hmm. So when I wrote the post a few days ago, you know, it, it's, it's, it's me arriving at this place. You know, I care about people. I love people. I really do. And I don't mean that ceremoniously. I really do care about people. And I really do love people. And I really want to see people at peace. And whatever that means for you, whatever you find your peace to be, of course, a healthy peace that's not destructive to you or someone else, yeah. whatever that means for you, whatever that looks like and feels like for you, I want you happy. I want you at peace. But if you believe that God has a fire pit and he's going to throw people inside that fire pit one day, if that gives you peace, I don't care anymore. I don't, mm. I don't believe it, but if that gives you peace, that's perfectly okay. Because I don't have to live in your head. I don't okay. have to live in your mind. You don't have to live in mine. So I'm just going to present some stuff. Maybe it resonates with you. Maybe it doesn't. But I'm no longer going to argue with you about it. Because you're not going to come around to see it my way. I'm most certainly probably not going to come around to see it your way. Especially if I'm talking against what, <laughs> what you're saying. So that, you know, again, for me, it, it, it's an arrival, so to speak. Yeah. I, I just kind of got here over time. I'm not an argumentative, confrontational person by nature anyway. Although then when I was the young Pharisee swearing that I knew the word and I yeah. knew what the Bible says, oh, I, oh yeah, I, I'd tell you in a half of a second how wrong you are, or at least how wrong I thought you were. Yeah. But, um, you know, I kind of... Like Push that aside now. I like that. I I feel like sometimes we can get tangled in this. All right, you have to decide. Are you preaching? Are you teaching? You're an influencer. You have to claim that yeah. label in that position. And I always get caught up and go, I don't want to be a teacher. I really don't. I <laughs> yeah. am a teacher. Like every day, yeah. I'm a homeschool <laughs> teacher. Like I have mm-hmm. kids here all the yeah. time. I'm constantly teaching. My life is about teaching. But mm-hmm. I get out here and I'm like, I want to think out loud. I want other people yeah. to think out loud with me. And right. none of us have to say we're right or wrong. Right. But I also come from this conditioning of back your, cite your sources, where are your statistics, right. how many other people have qualified this. Most recently, <laughs> I feel like I've come up with how many other men have qualified this. Mm. And it gets into this it, it, it pokes at my ego. And so my ego is like, Oh, we're going to show you, I'm going to show you it's qualified and I'm going to show you, I understand it. But yeah. yeah, like I said, that, that post, and I thought, ah, that probably plucked at me to challenge me because there yeah. might've been something I needed to work out. And that was exactly what it was. And now hearing you explain it, I'm in the same boat most of the time. Because a lot of things I speak to, people are like, oh, no, 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 no. And I'm like, look, just shh, I'm not going to prove it to you. But then yeah. other things I feel like I do have to prove. And I think that's a challenge for a lot of us, especially yeah. from some of the circles I've, I've rolled around in. It's like you have to have the proper theological presentation right. and backup. Right. And so right. we get seduced by that intellectualism and showing how much we know. But then it's yeah. like, that sometimes separates us even further from people and connecting. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I I have yet, you know, I've been on Facebook now for since 2009. So, you know, we're 20, well, no, not 20, we're 11 years or so, 11 years. And um, I didn't start off presenting this kind of stuff. Of course Um, it, it, I started off because I was in a word of faith and so it was more stuff about faith. Hey, if you can, you can believe God for a new house. You can believe God for a new car, stuff like that. Just yeah. drop those little lines and leave. Um, over, you know, when, when the message started transitioning into grace and unconditional love and our oneness with father and, and God is father of all. And, you know, we're all one with God, stuff like that. Um, you know, when it became more universal, more open to all, more embracing, more accepting, more inclusive, you know, you went through the 
the labeling, oh, you're a universalist, you're an inclusionist, you're this, you're that, you're mm-hmm. a new age, you're all this kind of stuff people say. You know, and I'd, I'd be offended. How dare you call me universalist? I don't even know what that is. And let me tell you why I'm not. You know, you're an inclusionist. I don't even know what that is. Let me tell you why I'm not. I'm a Bible-loving, God-fearing, da 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 person. Because, you know, you didn't want these labels. You didn't want these mm-hmm. labels. You, didn't, you know, they were, they, they were looked upon in a bad light. You know, you, you didn't want people to judge you that way. So you, even though the message was definitely universal in nature, you know, definitely traces of universalism all over it. Mm-hmm. You didn't want to be called that. Now, I don't care. Call me whatever. I don't even look. It doesn't look. I really don't care. And not because I've um, mastered my emotions totally, because there's still times I want to roll up my sleeves and say, buddy, you are just as wrong as wrong. You are, yeah. you are, you are so wrong. You don't even know how wrong you are. You're so wrong. You know, but you know, there, there's, there's this little still small voice inside of me that just says, it's not going to help. Yeah. It's not going to help. You know, if someone comes on your post and, and I, you know, I see some of your posts as well and, and they will make you say, hmm, <laughs> interesting. You know, that, that's, <laughs> that's pretty interesting right there. I tell you, <laughs> bold too, <laughs> very bold. <you> know? <laughs> and, um, and, and I can come on your post that you, you would post and say, you're totally wrong. How could you say that? The Bible clearly says, and I give you, I can, I can write, you know, a big two paragraphs full of scriptures. But you know what that's going to not do? It's not going to change your mind one bit. Yeah. It ain't change your mind one bit. Yeah. And you'll come back and you'll tell me, why you believe it to be this way you know what that's gonna not do it's not gonna change my mind one bit yeah and so i looked at all that and thought what are we doing you know so when people come locked and loaded ready to argue me down i know good and well no matter how i present a verse to you no matter how I tell you, I've studied it out in the Greek and the Hebrew, and, and I looked up the words, and the words really mean this. And I looked in the original manuscript, and it said this, not this. And, and I got this source and that. I know no matter what I tell you, more than likely, you're going to ignore what I wrote mm-hmm. and go right back to what you believe. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And my books qualify my position and, and my yeah. education qualifies what I'm saying. And I think we forget that each individual experience qualifies each individual perspective. Right. And exactly. there's no way we're going to ever share the same view as everybody no. else. Um, and yeah, it's hard. It's hard. Cause I mean, I should probably quiet down more than I'm willing to right now. I should be more intentional about that. I know that listeners. Thank you. I need to pipe down. Um, because I still, my ego, she is, mm, she's fierce. But um, at the same time, and I've learned this from my kids too, you know, my kids will say something and I'll just think, oh, you're so sweet and you're so young and you have so much to learn. And you're just like, mm, I love you. You know, even my 20 year old, you know, she's a mom now, so she knows everything. And, and I was there too at 18. I knew everything with her, but sure. I take that. I have to take that and I have to. Okay. Mm. And I'll say, all right, well, this guy, you know, he's like 23. Mm. Poor baby. His brain ain't even finished developing yet. So I'm not just, you know, and this guy like, and I'm just like, and I think I got this from Oshita Moore. She's like, I tell myself stories. Like what is going on with this person to make this person feel this way? And so Mm -hmm. if you're like, "Mm," and I will go there, I will go, "Mm, I bet this person hasn't been laid in a long time. And so I'm just gonna, it's all I know people say I should stop doing that too. Stop assuming no one's having sex. Well, I'm just, I'm happy all the time. Well, but, well look, I mean, you know, I mean, it's an easy way to draw that conclusion. I mean, in a lot of cases, happy, so. it does. It does. I've heard cannabis does too. So, I mean, let's. That's what I've heard. <laughs> but um, yeah, we, we need to, I think, and I mean, this is a message for myself, a lesson for myself. We do have to lighten up. And we sure. do have to go, look, this person has not lived my experience. Right. So I could come at any language and tell this person. And, and if they're not ready to receive the message, if they don't have yep. ears to listen, 
they're not right. going to hear me and they're just going right. to want, 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 want. Right. Um, and yeah, right. and that's awesome that you have, you've accepted that and you see that. And that's, it's something that I admire and respect because I'm, like I said, I know I have to tone down and I see how you respond to people. And I think, yep, there we go. And so see, I'm not a teacher. I'm still learning, still learning here, but we're all still learning. Sure. 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 And, you know, another thing too, um, I can't tell you how many times I've been wrong. I, I, again, I, I, I grew up in this thing. I, I, I was in ministry at a very early age, pastoring early on, always feeling like God is telling me something, right? So God has given me a word for the people. God has given me a word for this person. God has given me a word about a scenario going on in the church. And I'm always standing in front of people. God said this, and God said this, and God told me this, and God said, and, and I, I look back now on, on how many times I was absolutely wrong, just mm -hmm. flat out wrong. It was my emotions. It was my feelings. It was my thoughts. It was my ideals. It was my passions. A whole lot of me in that stuff. Very few times was actual what God said. And I realized if I could have been that wrong that many times, and I was sincere, I wasn't telling people, God said that if you put $100 in this offering this week, by next week, he's going to blow your mind. I wasn't doing that kind of stuff. I wasn't doing no frivolous God says as far as I understood. But nonetheless, even in my sincerity, I was incredibly wrong all the time. So if I could be incredibly wrong all the time, even though I was sincere, even though I wasn't trying to purposely mislead anyone, can't we all be wrong? <laughs> I mean, is anyone, is anyone immune to not being wrong about what they think God is saying or what they think something means? Yeah. I think we all are. And I think we all are, are, are you know, we're not immune to, to that possibility. So I, I, would, I just want to present a, a way of style, a style that says, let's just relax. Go, yeah, go have some more sex. Do something. Just Thanks. whatever you need to do. Go have some cannabis. Just <sighs> Whatever you, you need to Amen. do to relax. Yes, praise just God relax. on that. Yes, take it Listen easy. To this it's man, not people. that serious. It just, it just, I can't see it being that serious anymore. I just, I just don't. Yeah. You know, I, I, I believe we're all going to end up in, a, in the same destination. And I, and I also believe this as well. I'll say this. Um, I really don't know, and I don't think I believe anymore that God really cares what we think about God. Mm. And what I mean by that is, I don't think God is, is, is so consumed with what we think about God. Now, what we think about God does impact us. So if I think God is mean, angry, judgmental, condemning, then I'm going to treat people that way. If I believe God is love and pure love and pure unconditional love and full of grace and has no judgment for anyone in a negative way, then I'm going to also treat people that way. So what I think about God really impacts me. I don't think God really cares. Mm. You know, it, I, it, I think if God really cared, he, he had to kind of be egotistical in a way, which oh, I don't think God you, would be. You are, you're going to go to hell for saying that. You know that now. Like, <laughs> well, that's, a, that's, a, that's a new <laughs> new thought I've, I've been mulling around with, so I that's, might as well just say it here. That's good. That actually echoes something um, I just recently let, read. Um, just, And I can't even remember which ancient Greek philosopher it was, but this idea that, oh, the afterlife is just us all sitting around philosophizing and, and thinking out great thoughts. And I thought, that sounds really stupid. <laughs> We're just all yeah. sitting around con conversing. And yeah, leave me oh, here. Let's, leave me here. Leave yes, here. Uh, yeah. Leave and I'm like, here. that sounds boring. And then as some other ideas are always like, you know, or <laughs> Or we're all angels and we're all doing this. And I'm like, what is the point of my body? And what is the point of this experience and nature right. and the connections I feel if it's right. all going to disappear and turn into nothing. Yeah. And I just had someone on um, the other day, I was talking to him about this idea of like nothingness afterwards. And I think mm -hmm. I don't want to go there then I I'm good. Like you want me to forget my kids, my husband, yeah. Um, all the sex I've had, all of the great experiences. That's nothing. Come on. That's a big yeah. joke. Yeah. Um, yeah. Big time. But I think what is important is, are the things that we push aside. Like I think, and I've noticed this just in the last, I'd say four or five years when I started 
realizing that I couldn't be in the whole political realm is I was like, that's too serious. It's confusing. Sometimes it's just nothing but circular logic. Why am I not paying attention to like this, these stupid, repetitive, redundant, cutesy, annoying things my kids are doing every single day and going, because isn't that how God's looking down at us? Like, Mm -hmm. look at, look at what you're doing. And I've seen you do it 50 million times, but look at, it's adorable. And I love it. And this is what matters. And then just seeing and hearing people and we're not doing that. We're talking at people. We're blocking people. And I wonder what, how, how for you, how much of a struggle is it for you to present what you're presenting during this climate, the political (laughs) poop? (laughs) Uh, Is it a struggle for you? Like, do you it feel is. like you just want to tell people, shut up, stop, pay attention over here? Well, I want to tell them a little bit stronger than just yeah. shut up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Knock that shit off, people. <laughs> just, yeah, yeah, just just please, just just shut the fuck up. Just please, just shut the fuck up. Just all of y'all, just please. Just <laughs> yes, yes. I mean, I mean, yeah, it, it's it's over. I mean, I, I'm I'm always urging to say more in that arena but it's incredibly i mean if if you think religion is bad and you you know this i love that meme you posted uh yesterday i think about uh, who you're voting for oh, well if you need you know oh people, yeah the people that need you know, power of them power. Should voting yeah, yeah. they should vote and like what yeah and that's a, that's a great point like what, what, what do i need you for like what am i nobody but anyway, it's it's so it's such a compelling arena, right? You wanna you wanna dive in and, and tell what you think and how you feel and how you see this. And I'll I, I'll post something politically charged occasionally. But what I'm trying to do when I do it is I'm just trying to get people to understand one way or the other, one side or the other, right, left, whatever. It's, we do not have to take this that seriously. Mm. I don't think there's a politician alive who is fighting for you the way you fight for them. Yes. I just don't think that'll ever happen. I know you might think so. I know you think they're fighting for your causes and your, your beliefs and what you hold dear to you. I know you think they are. I know it. That's what they tell you. But trust me, at the end of the day, if it's you or them, guess who they're going to choose? Yeah, ain't you, baby. Mm-hmm. It ain't me, baby. So why am I going to go to, to bat in arms with another person over someone who will never do it for me? If, my, if, if something tragic happened to me and my case came before their desk, they, uh, they, they might you know, have a moment of compassion, perhaps, but they're not going to ch- charge into the chambers on the Senate floor and demand justice for me. They're mm-hmm. not going to charge into the to the, um, they're not going to charge, sorry, I got a call. They're not going to charge into the, the, the chambers of the, um, you know, the, the house floor and yeah. demand justice for me. They're not, you know, they might feel well, that's a terrible situation, you know, but that's all it's ever going to be. So why am I going to fight you? Mm. Someone I can talk to, someone I can, I can engage with. Why am I going to fight you over a political position? I think that is absolutely asinine and mm. a total waste of time. And we're yeah. playing their little game. We're their puppets. We're their nymphs. We're their we're their pawns. And I, and I don't I don't like using the word stupid, but I'll use it here. And I don't mean this disrespectfully towards anyone. But sometimes I just think we're too stupid to see it. Yes, yes. And as much as I don't like the Satan devil idea. I always think about the powers and the principalities. Okay. What are, what things out there, what systems, what structures, what concepts are out there that are working against us from bringing about the kingdom of God in the here and now. And if politics is literally all about either or. So when we're, and, and this is especially hard for me when I see people saying like, well, I'm deconstructed and I'm like, yeah, but you're still real political. Did you notice that? <laughs> yeah. That's part of the process. Peel that sure. shit away. 
Um, and it's nothing but pure division and it's heartbreaking it is. to see the way that we paint people in such images. And I'm like, we don't know these people. We say we're for grace. How are right. we judging these people? Well, I've never, and I'm, I, I, I know people hate him, but I, you know, and I was, I was right there like 18 months ago. I was like foul, horrible person. But now I look at Trump and I'm like, and I look at them all, Sanders, Biden, even the people I make fun of, I'm like, but at the same time, what they are doing has to be hard as it is. And right. then from that, this much hatred, millions, right. hundreds of millions of people declaring their hatred. And I'm like, I just don't want to add to that. I just yeah. don't want to add to that hatred. And yeah. I mean, sure, when I'm angry, I probably add a little bit too much contempt to things. But we need to focus on not adding to hatred not refusing to see goodness for what it is. And we have to stop seeing someone as our enemy because right, okay, fine, you, right. you acknowledge them as your enemy. What does Jesus say? Love that right. enemy. And we just, right. we are too stupid to figure it all out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I think we don't want to, right. Mm. Um, I, I, I said something the other day to someone, they were talking about something like this. You know, if you, if you see someone, hurting, help them. If you see someone hungry, feed them. Yeah. You know, th th this is the Jesus, you know, this is what Jesus said or something along that line. And just as I read that, the thought hit me very quickly. Um, the Jesus most people probably follow is the kind of Jesus that will throw their enemies in hell and save them. That's yeah. the Jesus most people are probably more comfortable with. Yeah. But the Jesus this post was talking about is the Jesus that they really don't like and the Jesus that really got crucified. Mm. They don't like that Jesus very much. They don't like the Jesus that, as you mentioned, said, love your enemies. What would we do as a nation? What, how differently would we be viewed in the world if when there was a decision to possibly go to war, did we say, we're not going to do that. Mm. We're going to go into the Taliban. We're going to love on them with an unconditional love like they've never known before. What would happen if we did that with ISIS? Mm. What would happen if we did that with every group of, or faction of people who called themselves our enemies? Mm. How differently would we be viewed? But of course, we don't really believe that. We don't believe we should lay down our arms and go love. We don't believe we should lay down our the theological positions and love. We don't believe we should lay down our political positions and love because somehow or another we've been del delusionally convinced that that is love because I'm fighting for justice and I'm fighting for this and I'm fighting for that and that's love. Well, love does no harm. So fighting's out so of there. It has to be, right? Yeah. Yeah. Fighting is, mm, mm, I love that. Yeah. What would our nation look like? And I've seen, um, I've seen what Rwanda, Rwanda, what happened with Rwanda? I, I constantly think I, I remember this reading a specific story about a woman who literally befriended the man that raped and killed her daughters and that beheaded her husband and that raped her. And she ended up being friends with this man. And living next door to him, and I'm going, that's some grace. And yeah. holy cow, how can I ever fathom offering that to somebody else? But then I think, well, with infidelity in my marriage, my husband offered that to me. You know, grace and, okay, well, we said for better, for worse, I'm assuming this is the worst. And we're going to grow from this. Mm -hmm. But we don't want to because we're angry. You know, when, when right. I'm angry at someone, I'm not forgiving them until they do this and this and this and this and this and prove to me that they're actually yeah. really sorry for what they did to me. And I'm like, well, what the hell? Like that, you want ultimatums? I hope to God God's not like that. And he's yeah. not. I don't, I can't believe God is like that. That God's like, well, I'm going to let you through, but like, give me them 10 Hail Marys first. You know, it's just... <laughs> And um, I'm, I'm, I checked your list, girl. Um, uh, that many? Uh, no, 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 no. You're going to have to go over there. You know, like, no, God's not like that. Love keeps no record of wrongs. 
Right. And that's the thing that I have to constantly remind even myself, you know, because we all have that little, that little ego monster that creeps in to tell us it's okay to hate this person. It's okay to be yeah. mad at this person. And we have to remember yeah. if I don't want God feeling that way towards me, I can't feel this way towards anybody else. Right. right. And I totally see that that's what you're putting out there. Like yeah. you have, you have such a compassionate view and it's you're so willing to include other people and i just really love what you've been doing and so i want to know what more are you working on what what else can we expect from you mr kyle butler i have recently been really engaging myself and digging myself into understanding quantum physics mm. um nerd you now know, this uh, yeah this this whole you know language that speaks into the invisible realm, the feelings, vibrations, the energy, the chakras, the, I mean, the, the, that whole nine, mm -hmm. everything that, that, that in, entails. Because to me, growing up in church, none of the spirit talk made any sense to me. Mm -hmm. But this makes total sense to me. This makes all that other stuff make sense. So I thought one day, there has to be a, a unilateral thing that every single human being has. I think for God to be wisdom, all wisdom, supreme intelligence, I think God would have to say, I've got to give humanity something that's going to work for every single human to ever live equally. It's, it will work for everyone unilaterally. It doesn't matter where you grow up, what nationality, what gender, none of that matters. I grew up believing it was get saved. You get saved, the boy, the blessings will happen and God will da 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 da. Well, I've been saved for a long time and that didn't happen for me, so that can't be it. And then um, I, I don't think it, it's a, a specific religion. I don't think Christianity is the answer, or, you know, um, Buddhism is the answer or, or Islam is the answer, one specific religion like okay if you get this you got it and this is yeah. how everything is going to work out so to me the only thing i see that god has placed in all of us unilaterally to be the same to work the same to produce whatever it is that we desire is our mind mm. and that the, the, the power and the ability of our mind and it's all equal for everyone so in this way god can't be a respect of persons he can't bless one more than the other, help one more than the other, mm. have a destiny greater than, you know, than another person has. God can't be the orchestrator of you're going to be the billionaire. You're going to be the, the person in the slummest of all slum parts of the world. That, that can't be fair. I can't see that as being fair and I can't see that as being love. Mm. So discovering what this mind does subconsciously, consciously, and you know, the, the the energies and vibrations and frequencies, how this stuff works, how love is working, this great power of love, how it permeate, permeates through everything and is in everything and creates everything and flows through everything, um, how we communicate with this invisible realm, all these things that are that happening, the universe inside of us. I've been really just fascinating myself with all this stuff. And what I hope to do very soon is to, to start um, some, some uh, tours around the country to uh to really kind of present some of this stuff especially and i don't like i don't like you know segregating people but uh i can speak to this because this happened to be um in the black community there's not a lot of this stuff being told yeah um we're we're very far behind the eight ball so to speak no pun intended for the color but um we're very far behind in this way we're very religitized. We're very, very fundamental. We we believe that Jesus Jesus is going to fix it, change it, make it better, yada 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 yada. And we're waiting for the big pie in the sky, we're waiting for that day to get to glory. And many of our communities are suffering because people aren't thinking their way out of their misery. Mm. And uh, I want to be a force for change and helping everyone, but but especially my community on how to think your way into a better life. Mm, I love that. Do you, do you see it? And I've, I've been coming to see this more and more 
Do you see that that's when you learn more about like your chakras and your inner energies and everything, do you look back at some Bible verses and go like, Jesus like was literally talking about our chakras right here. Oh yeah. 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 Um, Single eye, right? Yeah. Um, And so much of just his, his parables, I think if we're willing to look deeper, that's exactly what Jesus was talking about. Are you familiar with Kay Fairchild? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. So you've heard her, have you heard her, um, on the revelations and the set, the seven seals and the seven oh, yeah. chakras. Oh yeah. Um, I know Kay pretty well. Do you? Um, so I can throw her name out there. I know Kay very well. Um, yeah. we, we, we've actually, you know, I've got a chance to meet her. We were in a conference together last year. Oh, neat. Um, you know, I, I've spoken to her. I have her phone number and look at me. I'm Name driver. <laughs> <laughs> I got her number, y'all. You understand? Ooh. Well, I'm trying to get her on my podcast, so maybe I'll have you hook me up. I can hook you up. I, I got contacts. I know people. <laughs> um, but yeah, Kay, when I first met Kay, I, it was, she was on, um, I used to watch Don Keithley every Sunday morning. And one day he had her on there and she was talking about, uh, no penal substitution, every atonement. And I didn't even know what that was. And then I was listening to her and I was like, I don't know who you are and I don't know what you're talking about. And I just turned it because it was like flying right over my head. Well, about six or eight months later, someone said, Hey, check out this, this YouTube video. And it was her. It was, it was when she was doing the awareness series. Hmm. I'm like, I don't remember that person. So I, I, I tuned into it and I was like, Whoa. And in this first one I listened to, I think there may be, 12 or 20, I don't know, something like that. But this one I listened to, she said, God never needed forgiveness. Lord, he never needed to offer us forgiveness. So we never needed to get forgiveness from God because love is never offended. Mm. I was like, what the heck is she talking about? I, all my life, we've been taught to ask God to forgive us. What is she talking about? But when she said the, the, the other part I mentioned, love is never offended. I thought, well, that makes a lot of sense. Like, yeah. So she had me there. Yeah. And so I watched the rest of the awareness series and then, you know, started following her more and more. But something she said also stands with me today. She said, the scriptures are talking about what's happening within us. Mm-hmm. And that's exactly what I see today, too. Yeah. You know? One of the most powerful, most overlooked scriptures probably in the whole entire book is be still and know. Yes. If anybody masters be still and know, that is the key to life. Mm, It totally is. Oh, I love that. I love that we're ending there. Be still and know. Kyle. This has been an honor and I'm just so grateful for your willingness to come Me on too. and share your story. Thank you, Thank you Thank so you. much. How can people connect with you? Well, Facebook is my main platform. I love Facebook. It's where I do most of my stuff. Uh, so Facebook, Kyle Butler, you know, it's not a lot of people look like me. So find my picture. Not a lot of people keep... are as gorgeous as he is, is <laughs> uh, what he means to say. He's just modest, yeah. ladies. Well, you know, I'll, I'll let you guys <laughs> say it for me. <laughs> I will make sure I put your Facebook link down. Do you have any other websites yeah. where you can be contacted at? Uh, I have my, my personal website, KyleLButler.com. Okay. Uh, also YouTube, just Kyle Butler there. I'm subscribed and, um, to you on YouTube. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, we'll have more content coming soon. So uh, follow me, you know, YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, all my links are on my website. So if you go to KyleLButler.com, you can get all my links there. Just hit the links. It'll take you to my pages. You know, I always, I try my best to keep room open for new friends that want to come in that, are, that I perhaps want to, um, you know, just think a little bit because I'm not, I'm not going to try to teach you anything. Yeah. I'm not going to try to tell you what you know is wrong and I'm right. I'm just going to give you something to think about. That's it. That's all I desire to do. Give you something to think about. If it resonates, cool. If not, still cool. We can go lunch. We can hang out. We can be cool. We don't have to talk about anything but whatever you want to talk about. So um, that's my heart. I love people. I love you. I love people. People matter. You matter. I matter. We matter. Together, we all matter. No one is greater than the other. So 
if there's anything I can do to help you see how loved you are, how valued you are, not only by God, but by others around you, then I'm in. I'm in all the way. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you, Kyle. Thank you. Listeners, make sure you check them out. I'll be sure to post the links. And until then, thanks for listening.